I'm a cyborg. A really gross, weird one. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Alien Familiar RPG Podcast. I am Clayton. I am Beth. I am Haley. Uh, fill in the role of both Kyle Perkins and KD. It's KDP. Sure. <laughs> Uh, you expect many goofy voices. So I just want to remind everyone that you can find show notes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash alienfamiliar. I am on Discord as DM Scorpio number 0660. I've created a channel for Alien Familiar Media, and we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash alienfamiliarmedia. So if you enjoy our content and would like to help us out with hosting costs, any help would be greatly appreciated. So before we actually go into the topic of established IP- IPs, I want to point out that this episode is actually a prequel of the episode that we um, recorded on playing in the Wizarding World. Um, certain questions come up every so every time we're going to be talking about different IPs, and we're intending to make this a, a series, um, not s- a series going that this week we're talking about one IP, next week we're talking about another. No, this will just be spread out. We're going to be talking about other IPs, but this will definitely be a part in a sequence where we talk about IPs. And um, like all prequels, this is coming out after we've already started the story and we've already started the narrative. So um, hopefully this will not be like the Star Wars prequels and hopefully it will not also be like the Hobbit prequels. So I am realizing that making this a prequel is probably a bad idea. Yeah, I think we're, we're 0 for 2 so far. Yeah. And also, if it's a prequel to that Harry Potter thing, you need to split it into at least two parts. Yeah, what, we can't what? fit it all in one. Budget, just... <laughs> allow it. Oh. Uh, hey, Clayton, what is an IP? So... <laughs> Well, Haley, uh, that's an intellectual property, and, and let me let me spin you a little yarn here about. Oh, KP! Uh, I didn't know that you were here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody! It's old KP here, uh, and I'm here today to tell you about intellectual properties and uh, blah 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 blah. Wow! So amazing! So enlightening! Thank you, KP. It's kind of amazing. Like both of us immediately knew you were KP. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that is a very good impression. <laughs> I can't wait for him to So I wonder if he you. listens to the episodes he's not on. We're going to find out. Yeah. Yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to hear about it. <laughs> All right. So go ahead, Clayton. I'm sorry. I'm not really sorry, but go ahead. <laughs> so different intellectual properties that we're probably going to be talking about um, coming up. And this might be over the entire life of the podcast that we talk about other ones. But we've already talked about the Wizarding World. We're definitely going to talk about Star Wars and Star Trek at some point. We'll and probably Firefly? we'll yes. probably talk about Firefly, Lord of the Rings. I want to do Mad Max at some point. Oh, that'd be nice. cool. So, um, pretty much anything that has already been established, anything that you can go online and find fanfic about, qualifies as an intellectual property. So um, that's basically what we're going to be talking about. And today, we're just going to be talking about the generic intellectual properties as a whole because there are certain problems and certain issues that come up regardless of what setting it is. Anytime you're playing a game with an established story, you're going to have run into problems. And the first problem you're going to run into is how are you going to handle the canon? How are you going to handle the original, the original source material? And how is that going to impact the game? What parts of the official canon are you going to use as backstory or what is going to be the things that have already happened in the world what are the things that are currently happening in the world Um, how are you going to handle the characters that exist in in the intellectual property are you going to have them be present are you going to have the players interact with them are you going to have the players be them or are you just going to set it off set this story somewhere completely different so you never have to interact with the um the established characters of the of the story so um starting off with just the main story itself how do you all feel about having a role playing game where you play through the events of for instance a movie or a book personally that doesn't appeal to me 
because I feel that takes away player agency in the sense of, let's say we're playing through Star Wars New Hope. If I want to diverge from what happened, you know, it's, well, that's what I would want to do. I wouldn't want to just go through the script because then I'd just be sitting around with my friends reading the script, which could be fun, but that's not what I want to do. I want to play a game where I can add to the world, where I can make a character, where I can make my own choices and add to the story rather than just playing through one that I can't do anything about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would be really interesting um, from to take an established IP and be like, okay, we're going to play this, but in this case, the Empire wins instead of the Death Star being blown up. We're going to start from that. that like an alternate reality. Yeah, that sounds like fun because I can at least do something and change something. But literally playing through a game where we have to follow the script of the original movie kind of sucks. I feel like I wouldn't enjoy that now, but I would have been all over it as a kid. Like, did you ever have, like, did you ever have that friend who you, like, go over to their house to watch a movie and they know all the lines to it, so they, like, say the lines while you're trying to watch the movie? Like, I was not that person, but I I was friends with many of them. Yeah, no, stop it. (laughs) Don't, Haley, don't. It's terrible, it's terrible. But, like, I feel like as a kid, I feel like that could maybe be a good intro for really young players to have them play their favorite character, and you just, I mean, you enjoy just, you enjoy knowing things when you're a kid, you know what I mean? You enjoy the fact that you know, like, all these lines, you know these characters, and so I think maybe it might be a good introductory sort of thing to, like, you know, we're gonna do this, and, like, now, like, imagine, like you said, imagine the Empire one, like, what would happen to you then, and kind of introduce, like, that lateral thinking from there. See, I think that's interesting, because as a kid, I was always the type of person that was like, I like, I remember uh, explicitly, maybe not explicitly, but specifically, maybe, um, <laughs> playing uh, Harry Potter on the playground as a very young child, uh-huh. but I, we were never playing the characters, we were always playing, like, ourselves in Harry Potter. Oh, uh-huh. Um, and it was always like, and there was one guy we knew, I remember, who would be, like, the antagonist, and he always loved that, he, like, had a good evil laugh, and he was always yeah. just... Sky later went on to own a haunted house, so I guess maybe that explain that whole <laughs> awesome. thing. Um, but uh, yeah, he um, he would always be the antagonist, right? And so, but it would it would never be like he wasn't Voldemort; he was some dark wizard, right? And we were all wizards, but we weren't Harry Potter or Hermione or Ron or anything. So I think it's interesting that like as a kid, I would not have been all about that personally. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as for maybe using this as a way to, like, get people into RPGs, uh, very recently we had someone who'd never played before come in and do an Apocalypse one-shot, um, and I think he took to it a lot more getting to make his own character than he did doing, like, a pre-made or, like, following an archetype or something. Like, he, and, and maybe this was just him, but, like, he really got himself into character of, of the character he made and, like, was mm-hmm. really super into it, you know? And so I don't know. I don't know if maybe playing, mm-hmm. like... Han Solo in A New Hope. Like, I, it, I think that could be good if you're maybe less than an RPG, but maybe, like, uh, if you're an actor. Like, mm-hmm. if you're trying to, like, learn how to do these different roles, maybe something like that could be fun. But, like, if you're mm-hmm. playing a role-playing game and then you, and it's there's no added acting, like, in there, mm-hmm. this idea of getting to make your own character, I think, is more appealing just in general. Mm-hmm. Maybe I just think it sounds cool because every make-believe game I ever played when I was a kid, they wanted me to be the mom. I was always the mom in the story. Even when I was in kindergarten and it was, like, fourth graders, they were like, you be the mom. um, You're you're Ash's mom. Congratulations. (laughs) I just told you that I'm a huge dork and have always been thus. Uh, All the things I always wanted to play only had one female character, so I'd have to arm wrestle Megan Wazalewski for it, and I'd always (laughs) lose because she was bigger than me. (laughs) So I'd end up being Padme in A New Hope, who's dead, and have to sit on the slide alone. And it was really sad. So I just have a lot against it. Fuck it. I hate it. Uh, also, a really quick note about, about actors. Just <laughs> like... uh, on your really quick note about actors, um, I disagree greatly. I think role-playing is really beneficial because as an actor, you never want to imitate. That right. Is the, oh, that I wasn't is the saying, death of acting. I wasn't saying that, like actors shouldn't play RPGs. I was just saying, purely playing a character, like, an established character, like Han Solo in New mm-hmm. Hope, would be beneficial, like, just purely, like, both, do both, but 
having the actors do that role, um, like, it's, it's a, almost, it's a weird form of method acting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I understand. Like, it's fun. Like, I bet you, in, in the new Solo movie, um, the guy that played Young Han, I don't remember his name now, he's not actually that important. Yeah. But Maybe that guy. Do. Yeah, that guy. Kind of a hybrid thing where you're like, you know, what would, like, imagine what you would do if you were Han Solo. Sure. And then yeah. let the kids, you know, I'm still picturing kids playing this, <laughs> but like, whoever, you know, like, uh, run with that idea. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I was going at it more as, like, it could be a form of method acting. Like, I bet you that that guy, to study up on how Han acted, probably, like, imagined himself playing Harrison Ford in as Han Solo in A New Hope. And, like, yeah. maybe just, like, get into the mindset. Okay, I see, I see your point, point taken. Yeah, I do see how <laughs> it's it can be a very good shorthand for learning how to get into a character. But I have never ever in my history of role playing wanted to play an established character. I've always wanted to make my own character. I hate playing games. Like a pre-generated character is fine as long as they're not an established canon character. I can't even get get into wanting to play an established character even for, like, a superhero game where I would be playing, like, Spider-Man or Wolverine or any of the other characters that I absolutely love. If I'm playing a superhero game, I want to have a character who is entirely my own creation. I don't want to play my interpretation of what Spider-Man acts like or what Superman acts like. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you a question, then? No. Okay. You're not <laughs> well, we're just going to move on. Okay. End of podcast. Um, well, you can't just shut it down <laughs> by yourself. This is a unilateral decision. Look at me. I'm in charge of the podcast now. Clayton, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Gotta stand uh, up for yourself, man. Clayton, uh, for people on the podcast who don't know, Clayton and I actually met through a mutual friend playing one-shots, and a lot of the one-shots we played in were established universes where, um, like, one week we're going to be pick an 80s character and we're going to save the world. Or we played one where we were presidents. How do you feel about games like that? Like, for example, the 80s game. Okay, the 80s game. I was the game master, so I didn't have to play one of those characters. <laughs> okay, well... In the Dead Presidents game... I was the game master, so I didn't have to play any of those characters. I can only remember one time that I played an established character, in quote marks, and that was in Jordan's game, where we it was inspired by like the music from the 70s, um, where I played the fantasy equivalent of the lead singer of the Blue Oyster Cult. But that was... That was an entirely new character, even though it was based on a real person, because they were thrown into this fantasy realm. Okay. So, so it was so something... your interpretation yeah, of how they would be in that type of world. Exactly. I can't believe I forgot you ran those. Those are, like, my favorite games. That's kind of funny, I love honestly. the President's game. <laughs> um, you know, and that was... We used to play with a person. He doesn't play with us anymore. But all he ever did was play established characters. Like, he'd be like, yep, for this game, I'm going to be Ash from Evil Dead. Mm-hmm. Or this game, I'm Krauser from Resident Evil 4. And, like, I always thought that was really interesting. Because, like, he was, he was just kind of just playing those guys. And, like, that's fine, I guess. You know, it's... Because, you know, you're, if you're in a party with everyone else that made independent characters, like, having three randos and then Krauser from RE4, like, <laughs> it, it kind of works out fine. Because it's just... He's just hanging out with, like, three other guys. Uh-huh. You know, it's whatever. But I just thought that was interesting. Because he never really tried to make, like, an individual character. Mm-hmm. He was always, like... You know, this I'm playing this person. Mm-hmm. You know, and he would even go as as to far as just call them Ash or call them Krauser. But I don't know. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Like I, I I'm I'm suppose I'm guilty of that to a minor extent. Where usually in one shots, I'm I'm still trying to get that perfect Han Solo play going. Haven't haven't succeeded yet. But God, I've tried so many times and have not succeeded. Like like that that to me is the one character I think I would that or like Indiana Jones. I just want to play. This. I, can, I, can I be Harrison Ford? Is that just, like, a thing? <laughs> Don't we all want to be um, Harrison Ford? But yeah, no, I'm, if, if we're playing a one-shot and I really can't come up with something, I kind of default to, like, Indiana jones Hansel hybrid. And, like, so I guess I am kind of guilty of occasionally doing that. But for a full-length campaign, maybe I'm inspired by an established character, but I'm never going to, like, like uh, the person we were just talking about, I'm never going to just be like, yep, I'm now playing um, fucking... Uh, Denzel Washington's The Equalizer, and my name is The Equalizer, 
And uh, <laughs> yeah, and I and I talk like though. Denzel. Yeah, first name though, last name Equalizer. <laughs> you get yes. fucked. Well, in that game, you can play Denzel Washington, and I'll play Michael Caine. <laughs> I guess the only exceptions I can Michael think of Kane. are characters where they're seen as really open, not open-ended, but there's a lot of, like, room to explore the boundaries and lengths of the characters. Like, the only one I can think of is, of course, I'd play Harley Quinn, because she's insane, and no one knows what she's going to do, except for the fact that she's always going to go back to the Joker, and I think that's a really fun character flaw, and um, I don't know, I would have the most fun playing that. I've already played Harley Quinn unintentionally by accident, but um, I don't know. I feel like playing an established character that's not like, this is what I do, this is my only goal, with someone who's more open-ended like that, I think could be like a good in-between, I guess. Why is everyone looking at me like I'm lying? <laughs> no, I'm... You're giving me no, that face. Uh, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> what face? I don't have a face. That, like... Uh, Last time I was in here. It's just my face. <laughs> <laughs> just what I look like, Haley. You have a fucking problem? <laughs> yes! Look more like Harrison Ford. I, you know, I wish. <laughs> I wish. I'll try. <laughs> Get the smolder going on. God, what if I just played Harrison Ford in, um... Not Pretty Women... He wasn't in that. It was uh it's another it's like an early like, like a late eighties romantic comedy, um, starring also Sigourney Weaver. Oh my god, I know exactly what you're talking oh, about. Um, Fuck. <laughs> well, I'll never remember. I know that. exactly what you're talking yeah. about, but I don't remember what it is called. Oh, Working Girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll just play Harrison well. Ford in, in uh in Working Girl. I like how you think Harrison Ford is such a man that you gave him extra women in pretty women. <laughs> 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 you're right. <laughs> Just the manliest man, you know? And well, he obviously played Joe in Pretty Women. <laughs> no, Pretty <laughs> Women! It's, it's, I... it's Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman. No, it's Pretty Woman and, and Little Women. And I'm little thinking, women. okay, great. I just have to see that combination where they're all just like Ew, hookers. No, no. <laughs> That's kind of terrifying. We have to stop the podcast and make this movie, guys. <laughs> God. I think Harrison was... Ford's a little, uh, little beyond acting in that film. Just saying. There's nothing Harrison Ford can't do. Uh, you know, the I movies bear that out. <laughs> disagree with you. Oh, that's fine. All right. So, so what were you? What were you even saying, Haley? Your I words are coming out of your mouth. We find it not an interesting segue back on. to the topic because I don't. <laughs> Well, okay. <clears throat> so we've talked a little bit about our thoughts on playing established characters, um, but but this was all supposed to be about canon. So I guess like. How do we feel, I know how I feel at least, but like about established characters running around in the universe? Because for me it depends on the universe. Like you guys, like your PCs are individual characters that are unique. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and we've definitely touched on this in other topics, but like, you know, you got your, you got your Darth Vader running around, or you got your fucking Voldemort. Well, it depends on the story, because in Star Wars it is definitely the Skywalker story, and Harry Potter is definitely Harry Potter's story. In Star Trek, it's the story of whatever particular ship you're on. Yeah, you, was the yeah you've got to have at least any characters that would be known to everyone in the setting. Yeah. But even, like, in my examples, like, those characters are the story. Like, oh, those established uh -huh. characters are the story. There yeah. is no real other story going on besides their story. Right. Whereas, like, in something like Star Trek, you're just one ship in the fleet. Even in the series, there is acknowledgments that the other ships are out doing stuff. So there's not this this feeling that everything hinges on what the main characters are doing, which is a big pitfall if you're going to be doing an established canon story with established canon characters who you aren't playing. Right. Well, I, I don't know if other ships are meeting God like the Enterprise is, but like I, I, I get what you mean that there are other ships out there, like yeah. also on missions doing things, and I, and I guess to a lesser extent that's true in Star Wars, but you definitely don't get that vibe as much because it's just like yeah, there, there there are those there's those people in the cantina. What are they doing? But they're not really important because they're not part of the plot. You know, mm -hmm. um, but if I, a good oh, oh no, please, if a good enough <laughs> world has been built by the IP, then you can have adventures that take place with, like, the main thing in the background. 
Um, the thing that I think of is I played a lot of Lord of the Rings online. Like your whole your whole adventure that you go on, like you occasionally interact with some of the characters from the main plot, but it's just tangential. They just kind of, you know, skirt against your story occasionally, and there still was room because because the world is so well built mm -hmm. to have a lot happen outside of that, but with the sense of urgency brought to it by the fact that the main story is still happening and yeah. you're trying to move along through your part of the story, you know, doing little, being part of different battles that are taking place in the same war or whatever. I guess, I think for me personally, a good rule is I always want you, the characters that are the players are playing are the main cast. They are the main focus. It is their story. If you bring in someone, for example, like Harry Potter, it's going to become Harry Potter story. So if you're going to use canon characters, I would pick characters that add to the player story rather than would take it away and make it their story. Mm. So I feel like, you know, if you were to bring in Tonks or one of the Weasley kids, that's fine. But if you bring in like Harry Potter, if you bring in Voldemort, they only, they got very specific goals and they're mm -hmm. going to just completely take over a campaign mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or a one shot. For me, whenever I'm playing in an established world, it's about adding to the world and adding to a story rather than being like, I just want to do Harry Potter because I want to see Harry Potter again. That's If you want that, go watch the movies. Mm -hmm. Your players are there to add something to the story. Well, this came up on, and I wasn't there for the Harry Potter episode, but God, do I wish I was because I had opinions. <laughs> I, I have uh, a lot of thoughts about Harry Potter. But like, you know, I don't think there's a problem with running around Hogwarts at the same time the trio is, personally. Like, to me, if, if you're playing with a group of players and they're really like, yeah, we want to be there and be, like, contemporaries of the main characters, like, we but we all love the series and that's, you know, always been, like, a, a wish fulfillment thing for us. I, I'd be like, yeah, sure, you know. I, you're not going to interact with them a whole lot, probably, but, like, they'll be there. And maybe you'll have, like, some sightings and maybe, like, the final battle you're, like, fighting alongside them mm -hmm. or something. I'm certainly not opposed to that. I, don't, I, think, I think that's fine. I think that, like, what is RPGs? We can act as highbrow about it as we want, but what are <laughs> they besides honestly being fun and having, like, wish film? Right. Mm -hmm. So, like, to me, I guess, I, I don't know if that was necessarily what you were saying, but, like, to me, that's know. sort of I, where I come from. I don't know, like... For example, the Harry Potter yeah. Hogwarts mystery. There's an app game right now. Play it. Um, it's a, it's a prequel because it was smart enough to know that if you put it in the Harry Potter universe and you put it next to Harry Potter, Harry Potter's going to overshadow shadow everything. So they set it as a prequel where you still get to interact with all these characters, but Harry Potter's still a baby. He's still just you know this myth. Well, he's still more important than you, even even when he's a baby. Listen, I'm a curse breaker named Fiora Thorne, and I will smite you. Okay. <laughs> So whenever I play in an in an IP, I want to play a character who is literally the hero of their own story. I don't want to play a game where where I'm at Hogwarts and Harry Potter is on the battlefield dueling it out with Voldemort, and I'm just in the background handling um, Dark Wizard Number Two. Yeah, <laughs> and that's if you were to have that climactic final battle in your game. That's kind of what it would come down to, mm. unless you, the game master, established that. Yeah, if you thought of it ahead of time, you could bring a sniper rifle there and shoot Voldemort <laughs> in the head while he's dueling Harry. Yeah, <laughs> because, I guess because you know, that's absolutely something a character, a, a player character, would sure. want to do. Like, let me snipe Voldemort, fight. boss. Yeah. I'll do it. Um, I guess you know. There is the option of, like, you've built up Dark Wizard number two to be, like, a, a big antagonist to your character, and, like, Jim's gonna get a good job of, like, fleshing that character out. But still, even then, like, it's still just Dark Wizard number two. Even if you give yeah. him a name oh, and everything you? else. No, I'm kicking you. Um, <laughs> even if you give him a name and everything else, and you really, like, have a lot going into this final battle between the two of you, Voldemort and Harry are still over there. Yeah. Like, the, it doesn't change that fact. The really big bad is right over there, and we're not interacting with him. Yeah. So, I, I guess I get that, you know. But, like, let's say the, the campaign does not end with a Voldemort fight. Like, let's say it's literally just, like, fucking, I don't know, book five or something. And uh, You're a senior in book five. So. Sure, yeah. Okay. And uh, so Harry and them go off to the the Department of Mysteries. But you're, you're just, like, about to graduate. You've got your own shit to be doing. And maybe there's another mystery going down or something else. 
but it's a separate, it's set continued, like, uh, in the same timeline there, and, and it's con- coinciding with events, but they're on two separate tracks. Like, you're not gonna be fighting Voldemort, and neither is Harry, really. So, like, you know, y- there's gonna be two different things going on there, and, and, you know, you could even fucking homebrew some other big threat that looms that you have to take care of. Um, I, in my mind, that's okay, but I, I do agree with both of you that, like, being overshadowed sucks, you know? Like, I've definitely been overshadowed in games that weren't established IPs, and, like, I wouldn't want it, that to happen in, like, like, your journey in with, with Luke Skywalker. Like, I, I played in a Star Wars game that was set in the Legacy comics. Uh, it was, like, me and Nina, my, uh, yeah, we, we played in that. And, like, our part of our adventuring party was, well, not really a part of it, but he was, like, an ally, was Cade Skywalker, which is in, in, in those comics is, like, the protagonist. And it was unfortunate because, like, it w- there was definitely a, a lot of hand waving there. Of like, well, you, can't, you guys can't actually fight him. So, like, just don't even try. He'll, he'll be your ally, though. You know, and you're just like, what if I want to fight him? I- I'm a pretty competent combat character. I think what I could if, take down yeah. a Skywalker. What if you fight him and you get several criticals right in a row? Yeah, boom. Fuck that guy. Like, I don't know. So, I, I get that is that is the problem. Like, if you're going to be setting it in a certain time frame... Be sure, like we've always said, you know, if you have a ma- if you have a named character show up, be prepared for them to bite the dust because like it could happen. Um, I think it's something that I haven't encountered yet, but something I've anticipated. I really look forward to in games that I either play in or run in established IPs is having the canon still existing, but it's still going on and interacting with your story without any of the characters being present. Like for example, I was going to be in a Firefly game, which is my favorite established IP, and um, Firefly was still going on, it was before the Serenity movie, and whenever we were in danger with the Alliance, uh, they'd be like, we have to go, there's a Firefly class running around, and it would just be like, our get out of jail free card so we could do whatever the fuck we needed to do, so I could keep a timeline of what we're doing, and what the show's going on. That was really fun for me, because I'm still doing my own thing, and I'm still a big threat, and yeah, the Firefly might interrupt some of the stuff that we're doing, but they're they're not the story. They're something else that's going on while we are our main own thing. I think that could be really interesting for some other established IPs. Like, for example, in the Lord of the Rings series, like, while Frodo's off doing the ring, your whole campaign can be like, listen, we have to protect this town. Some bad shit's going on, and other people have to go do big things, and this is our thing that we can do. And that could be a really intense mm-hmm. thing. And still have all of these battles coming through and have to take care of wounded that are going on and having all the orcs that are running around. Like, that could be awesome. And it doesn't conflict or take away from the story. I don't know. I've just, it's not something I have personally encountered. And I'd really like that. I want to see more of it. Um, really quick, I, I've really been going to bat for, like, <clears throat> continuous storylines with established characters. Um, but I want to, like, I guess my own, my own beliefs plainly clear would be that, like, I would rather do before or after, personally. Mm-hmm. The only time I'd really want to do this is, is wish fulfillment, is literally if the players were mm-hmm. like, we really want to go to school with Harry, or, like, we really want to be in Rogue Squadron with Luke. I'd be like, okay. But for me, it's a lot easier and I think more fun to do before or after stories. Mm-hmm. I've mentioned I've played in a couple anime games that are based in established IPs. I've done Fairy Tale and One Piece. Um, I'm actually, I'm, both the games are still going on. But in both of those, they're set after the main storyline. So, like, you know, for One Piece, a big part of that is, like, the Devil Fruits to give all the characters their powers. Well, all those are now free up again because the characters that had them in the series, they're all dead. You know? And then same thing with, like, Fairy Tale. A big thing in that is guilds, wizarding guilds. Um, well, in this timeline, it's way in the future. It's a bunch of new, different guilds. The, the original OP crew isn't around anymore. And so that you have a lot more flexibility there. Or you can have callbacks. You know, you can, like, run into relics from the, the shows, right? And that's pretty cool. But you're never going to worry about, the, you know, especially for a shonen anime where the main character is literally unbeatable for most, you know, senses of the word. You're never going to worry about that guy showing up and, like, overstaging you because he, he's just dead. Fuck him. <laughs> we don't need him, you know? So personally, and, and obviously we can talk about this as well, I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts, but, like, I am definitely more... I will go do a continuous storyline if people really want that wish fulfillment, but I would rather do preferably after uh, myself. What would, Are you guys a before or after kind of... I feel like, yeah, I feel like before you could run into what happened with, like, the Star Wars prequels, 
where you know, like, certain people are gonna make it because they show up in four through six, parts four through six, so it's like, there's no sense of, uh, there's no sense of fear or urgency or anything any at any point mm -hmm. during the stories because you know exactly where most of the characters are going to end up. That's actually one of the problems I had with Star Wars Rogue One is, like, when I'm watching it, it's like, none of these characters ever show up again, and then you get to the end and you find out why. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> That's not okay. okay. Spoiler alert. Uh, because <laughs> they all got on their ship... And they went through a portal, and they ended up in a different part of the galaxy, and they've been trying to make their way back to get to the Rebellion. Oh, uh, yeah. Cassian and Andor. They're, it's yeah, like they're stuck out in the Delta, qu Delta Quadrant. <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're hanging out out there. It's they like went out to, uh, to Grandma's farm out of the Delta Quadrant. Yeah, yeah, we, we put them out of the farm. <sighs> so that's why I like to do things after, is because then you don't have to worry about, well, why, why haven't the main characters heard about this big awful thing that our characters are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah. why haven't the main characters, why isn't their story reflected in the actions that we've done? Because the, th the things the player characters are going to be doing are probably going to have some sort of impact in the universe as a whole. And so it, it becomes a plot hole of why the established characters haven't yeah. had there, there's nothing ever heard from your characters again. Mm -hmm. Unless there's either, you know, some worked into, it's either worked into the plot where it's something that's kept secret or it's far enough in the past that maybe it's just been, you know, passed around as myth, but people don't really discuss it. Like, people don't really know about it. You right. know what I mean? Like the, like, I keep going back to Star Wars because Star Wars was such a huge expanse of universe um, <laughs> with, like, the, the Knights of the Old Republic stuff that was going on in the video games and books and stuff like that. And then it also had, like you were just saying, Katie, like the legacy era after the, before it all got scrapped. Yeah, that was like 1,200 years after Return of the Jedi, which is freaking ridiculous. Why did I say fucking ridiculous? It's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> like, that, to me, having, and just as a slight <coughs> side note, like, th and that's what I love so much about the Star Wars Expanded Universe, who, as it was before, was like, I can't even really think of, of another property to me that, like, you have basically a, a timeline that's from the end of one movie all the way to 1,200 years in the future. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a massive amount of content. Mm -hmm. And I know that they didn't get quite there. Uh, I know the books were, like, starting to get toward that direction. Like, they were setting some of the stuff up for the comics. Uh, but, like, that's still ridiculous to me. Like, 1,200 years, damn. Yeah, and whenever you factor in, like, the old Republic stuff that's been made. So you've basically got ba about 3,000 years worth of Star Trek or Star Wars history that you can play in. Yeah, that's a huge, like, playground for, for anyone trying to run a game. And, that, and that's what I've always loved about Star Wars, and that's why, to me, if I'm running an established IP, it's always going to be Star Wars. Because it's just, there's, there's so much to play around with, and, like, and it's so easy to dodge that issue of what are the main characters doing. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much other shit going on, and, like... The movies, if you're just going out the movies, the, the galaxy is not that big. It's really not. Mm -hmm. It's you like know. five planets. Yep, and, and there's just one it's, family. It's that's slightly important. bigger than the Firefly universe. Yeah, right. You but, leave the Firefly universe out of this. <laughs> um, but you factor in all the books and everything else, you have such a huge thing that you could do, a story set around the time of A New Hope, way out in the unknown regions where, like, Luke ain't never heard any of that shit, you know? Like, he's a farm boy from Tatooine. He's never heard of, of uh, the Chiss or... Uh, the, the Outbound Project, like, that's that's not going to factor in his radar at all. That's just something you can play around in, and I think that's good. So we've talked a lot about canon and story, <laughs> and uh, was that a bunch of other we, We've talked about point one. Hell yeah. A lot. <laughs> oh, I love the next point. Well, that we're going to talk, don't you worry, listeners, we're definitely going to talk about that next point instead of me just <laughs> reading off the board. Um, let's, let's talk about the real world. Yeah, I love the real world, except for the fact that it's awful. So, did, hey. would you say you love the real world, except for the fact you live in it, Haley? Yeah. That's really depressing. <laughs> I know. Oh, so right. So, so, if you're gonna talk about the real world as established IP, then does that make every novel that's ever been written fan fiction? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, going back, I, going back to that definition earlier, by the way, Clayton, you described it as, if there's fan fiction written about it, it's an intellectual property. Yes. 
I have read Slipknot fan fiction, Clayton. Does that mean Slipknot is an intellectual property? <laughs> Absolutely, Slipknot is an okay. intellectual property. So would they, you run, they have copyrights. Would you run a Slipknot RPG? Personally, no. <laughs> um, I have played in a WWE RPG one-shot where there was established canon. Oh, well, that's definitely and, an intellectual property. No, yeah, it's a huge intellectual property. There's a lot of werewolf polyamory uh, fan fiction out there. Don't ask how I know that. There's, like, at least seven. With Randy Orton. <laughs> no, I'm talking about The Shield. Oh, okay. Get it together. Uh, you said WWE. Yeah, I know. Obviously, The Shield's better than Randy Orton. Get your head out of your butt. Uh, okay. Uh, so... <laughs> You're feisty today. Me. <laughs> so if you play yourself... Is this you writing fan fiction? Well, Let's I'll lay it on the table. All the cards. All the cards on the table. Are we writing fan fiction we play ourselves? Haley, I don't want your answer. Beth. I think so. Yeah. You are you are playing the ultimate Mary Sue. Oh. Oh my god. <laughs> nice. You are inserting yourself into whatever story you are and playing. making yourself the coolest person there. Professor Kyle, am I allowed to speak now? Um... Uh, yes, uh, Haley, what, what would you like to say? Do you really think the four of us around this table are going to survive the zombie apocalypse? Of course it's a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if certain other people were here, I'd say probably. Well, I mean, um, we're not going to survive all alone just because Jordan is super well fortified and KP has, like, maxed out charisma. We're all going to die. I mean, yourself. I might, sir, I might survive, like, a week longer than you, but, like, I'm gonna Ooh. die. Yikes. I wouldn't I make it. I require way too love. much help from established <laughs> things in this world. Everyone There's dies. No way. Everyone dies. Not everyone truly lives. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but I think it's, that's something to be interesting about how you were talking about how we play the ultimate Mary Sue. Um, because I know that you were floating around the idea of if we were to play ourselves as characters, everybody else makes the character but you. Mm-hmm. Like setting actual stats, I think that could be really fun and interesting. That should be a topic for another day. Um, but with historical characters and real world stuff, um, I think anything that requires knowledge of the universe. So, for example, if it was set in the Wild West, or if it was set in a specific historical time, that could count as an established IP, like steampunk stuff. Sure. I mean, I've played now. I think like. Four different historical figures in RPGs. I played Constantine the Ninth twice, <laughs> um, and then I don't remember the other two, but I know I've done it. Did um, you play him differently each time? Um, yeah, him and him and Fate. Well, I didn't super play. You played him more in Fate, technically, but um, like the first time I played him, he was just like literally uh, Jesus again, <laughs> because I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a problem. <laughs> But, um, I, you know, that's that's the weird thing about it, is, like, is that an established intellectual property, though? Or any of that? Because, in a way, like, if you're doing an obscure historical figure no one's ever heard of, to other people, that's a unique character. Like, if I'm playing, you know, um, Matilda of Tuscany in an RPG, like, I, I at the table, do you guys just no. off the cuff? Right. Obviously, <laughs> Maybe, I do know you? Okay. who Matilda from Tuscany is. Um, but, uh, I don't know. Yeah, you was that she in that movie with Danny DeVito? <laughs> she could have. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, actually, there's a medieval version of that film. Um, it's basically the same plot, but it's set in, uh, like, 1100s uh, Northern Italy. It's a mm. fantastic film. Nice. Danny DeVito really just doesn't film it. <laughs> Oscar winning performance. Um, but, like, I don't know. To me, that's where it gets a little tough. It's because, like, other, to other people, you may know that it's a historical figure. To other people, that's going to come off as like, wow, you played, like, well, that was a cool character you played, you know? And you, and you just be like, thanks. <laughs> totally original. But in reality, you, you just read a history book once, and now everyone thinks you know, you know things and you don't, but it doesn't really matter because you and everyone else in your field pretend that you all know things, and then there's just this endless cycle of peer editing where none of you actually know anything, but you keep pretending that you know things. I'm sorry, I'm getting off. Are, are you okay? I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay. But, but my point here being is that these, these things, like, th- that's hard for me to quantify, is like... Just where where is the line there of playing an established character for for a historical figure if no one's ever heard of him? What do you guys think? Do you boo? That's my thoughts. If you want to play a historical character, totes your goats. Right, but do you think? <laughs> th- thanks, Haley. I'm, I'm glad you are supportive. Um, but do you think that that like should count as an established character? 
Especially yeah, if people haven't he's... heard of them. Okay, but listen. History is... No, like, if it's really, 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 really long ago, who's to say that half that shit's not made up? We made up Dracula off of an established person who is real. And, you know, I think that it could be really fun to take a character and dramatize them. And yeah, they exist. You're not coming from a stemming... You're not stemming from a point of origin that is original. Therefore, I think it's an established IP. But but then Clayton mentioned earlier that his '70s character was a fantasy take on uh, the lead singer of Blue Oyster Cult. So like in this case, if you're doing a fantasy take on Matilda of Tuscany, like does that does that change things? I or? guess the thing that I would say is that like let's say I'm inspired by the Blue Oyster Cult and I'm gonna name him this and this is his history. It has nothing to do with that, but like the vibes or some aspects are inspired rather than let's say example I'm going to play. Constantine the Ninth, but in this world everything's the exact same, but he has magic powers. That's... I feel like there's a difference because one is being influenced and one is taking it from the point and then diverting from it. Hmm. Rather than being on its own path. Interesting. My original intent with like talking about historical characters and stories as intellectual property is like taking actual events. Like, for instance, I've done research about the D-Day invasion. Um, I'm handing you guys character bios of people who were really there. We're going to role play out. Right. Okay. The storming of the beach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, do you add in there if those people died at the uh, during the invasion, or is that like we'll let the dice decide? I guess we would let the dice decide. Nice. Hmm. Interesting. So, like taking something that actually happened and real people and using those in the game, I kind of, I, I definitely consider that the same in the same vein of doing an intellectual property. But like, if you're taking a character and just from history and you're putting them in a completely different setting, mm-hmm. like a different time period or a, a different world, sure, then it it becomes less of doing it like in the overall theme of what we're talking about here. It's more doing a, your own interpretation of something rather than doing something in something that is already established. I don't know. I'm a, I'm a huge nerd, so, like, if I'm running a historical game, you're going to be playing, like, characters you came up with that, like, fit the historical bill during the time mm-hmm. period, but it's not going to be, like, existing characters, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, in that way, I guess it's fan fiction of... But see, I guess in that I guess in that regard, historical fiction is literally just historical fan fiction. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, so, like, I guess maybe that's sort of what you're doing, and I guess that would be, like, an established IP. Like, if I was gonna run a Tombstone game, but none of you were playing the actual gunmen there, you were all playing, like, Townsfolk, for some reason. Fun. Yeah, I'm loving that (laughs) idea. You get to watch it happen, Clayton. (laughs) We'll have to see if you piss your pants. (laughs) I don't know, that was a bad example, I guess. But, like, alright, let's say instead it's, uh, you're playing soldiers during the Reconquista uh, in, like, the late 1400s. That would be a little different, because you obviously have... But even then, you're still kind of at the beck and call of the powers to be. So I don't know if you really get that much, like, freedom. You Mm -hmm. know? Maybe do. I don't know. I feel like if you use it as a jumping point rather than, like, we're going to play this battle exactly the way it went. Mm Mm-hmm. And be like, yeah, we're gonna storm the beach of Florida. Oh, and by the way, uh, there's a magic fountain. <laughs> I'm gonna go now. <laughs> oh, we're, Florida. We're, we're going to role play the uh, the Cuban refugees to Florida in the early eighties. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a mouth. They found that's who really found the fountain of youth was the uh, Cuban refugees fleeing from Castro. I'm okay, uh, you know what, Haley? I'll give you, like, not even partial credit. I'll give you, like, one-third credit. Thank you. Uh, that you knew <laughs> that sp- that Florida was once ruled by Spain, and that Spain was where the Reconquista was. Hell yeah! But that you is all I you know that? You know what, let's just move on to the next one. All right. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's about all I can take. I guess um, established IP for new players. I wouldn't mind is- talking about that really quick. Um... I think that it's a good stepping off point. I think that, like, you know, I'm going to call back to that example I gave earlier where we had, I had a friend recently who came into town, longtime friend, um, who had never played D&D before, but always had kind of the interest. Um, he took pretty well to just a 
it was like a space apocalyptic, like we were on a colony planet. He took pretty well to that. It was not based off anything. I don't know if other people would, especially like, because he, he had been waiting for the excuse to play Tandy for a long time, but had never had the chance. There were some people who maybe had, weren't like him, who were like, I, I'm not, not saying he was super enthusiastic about playing, but like he had wanted to play. But for other people who might be a little more hesitant, um, I think an established IP is a great way to do that. Like if they're a big fan of Star Wars, you know. Bring him in. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Lord of the Rings is especially easy because it's already basically a D and D campaign. Mm. Like it's like training wheels. You just like change a couple names and throw in a ring. <laughs> Boom! You got a D and D campaign. It's great. Um, so I think that that's. I think it's good. I I didn't do it this way. My first ever game I ran and with people who had been playing for the first time, I ran my own world. But like in hindsight, if I were to run for a different group of people who weren't enthusiastic about it, because again, I lucked out in that. Everybody wanted to play D anD. There were people who were like, were friends from work who were like, "Oh, I've heard about D anD D, but I don't know anything about it." I'm like, "Oh, but you really like Star Trek? Mm-hmm. Let's play Star Trek." You know, and I think that that just gives them a basis point because they know like how characters would act in Star Trek. Right. Like they know the Spock archetype, they know the Kirk archetype, et cetera, et cetera. So like they'll mm-hmm. they'll they won't be just like they'll they'll know the limits. I think that's what yeah. they'll know the limits of what they can do in the universe, which is big right. for. People learning for the first time. Not a, they'll not only know the limits, but they'll also know what is possible that they can do. Right. Because that's a huge thing when you're starting out with a role playing game. Is you really don't. It, it's terrible to tell a new role player in this game you can do anything, and they're like, yeah. "Wow, I hate that." They're like, what does that mean? Yeah. yeah. I think it's the same as where we've talked about. You know, it's good to bring new players in by like setting the game in the real world in the place where you live or playing yourselves the first time around or something like that it's it's the same thing that you know yeah. like what you can do and if you pick an established property or even established characters they automatically know well assuming they're familiar with it they know exactly like, like what we said like they know what han solo would do in um, in this cantina where Greedo's right. sitting down in front of him. He would wait until Greedo shoots right beside of him and yeah, then he would draw and then his gun he would and shoot at shoot him. He would yes, never shoot That him. is exactly what Han Solo would do. <laughs> He's an honorable and, and, man. And it's what he has always done. Yeah, there's the, just go watch the movies. It'll, it's right there. <laughs> oh, it's been with those <laughs> but if the character did want to divert from that and like wanted to be the type of person who would shoot first, I mean, it would you would be able to give them that freedom and they would be able to to play that and put their own take on the character. Oh, I was going to say that um, that also by setting new players in an established IP, you give them a chance to kind of break learning about RPGs into blocks because if you set something in an established IP, then you give them a chance to see how the real world or that IP translates into the rules. Mm-hmm. And then once they've seen that one time, it becomes easier to move into another system and translate the opposite way. Translate the rules into what you can do. That's all. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a very good I agree. point. Yeah. Um, so I guess so let's... So let's talk about game system since it was brought up. Um, since you were talking about like the rules themselves, um, how, the, how the intellectual property would be interpreted into the rules themselves... There's always a decision of whenever you're going to play in an established IP, what rules are you going to use? A lot of IPs have game systems associated with them. Um, D&D has several. Um, Star Trek has several. Star Wars has several. Something that I think is really interesting if you're looking into a game that you want to play, but there's not actually a system for you, GURPS is really good. It's pretty much a universal system. But it's almost I, like a generic universe. Yeah, I know. It's like, crazy. Um, but I have a big, hard crush on uh, World of Darkness because it's modern. And you can pretty much put anything into it. I use it a lot um, because I think it's the most malleable. Uh, unless you're doing, of course, something that's more high fantasy like Lord of the Rings or another fantasy novel. Then, of course, I feel like it's more natural to go for a D&D. But... Um, You want to do, like, a supernatural thing or based off of some books, I highly recommend looking into World of Darkness because I think it's a pretty easily malleable um, D10 system. I don't think Supernatural actually has its own system. I don't know. That's fine. I I would be surprised if Mark Weiss Productions hasn't that up and put it in the show notes. So I've never seen it. 
Um, I know they have, like, I, I know that there is a expanded universe of Supernatural. I've seen books, mm-hmm. but I've never seen, like, a role-playing game. Star Wars has a really good one. I know you've ran a few games, and then um, Jordan's also run a few. Yeah, I, I haven't run the new, new one, which is, uh... Edge of the Empire. Edge do you Empire. want it? No. Though I do own the book. I got it as a gift <laughs> for Christmas. I, do, I intend to... you have to, the dice? Nope, which is the other that one. Well, then you can't play it. <laughs> yeah, that's a non-starter for me. Um, but, no, I've, I've run Saga, which is D20 system, and that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else I've done that's been in an, an official... I've played in a Star Trek game only for a couple sessions. It was interesting. That's all, I, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> uh, I, it was just unfortunate because I, I only was in there for like two or three sessions, but I was playing like... We were like a Black Ops Federation team, and I was playing a sniper. Section 31. Yeah, but... Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. You're a nerd. About. <laughs> uh, we... Like, I, and I was playing a sniper, but our captain was the very a very charismatic uh, Vulcan, which... What? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, but very rational, but also, like, able to, like, carry conversations. Maybe she was half Vulcan. I, I don't remember. But, um, anyway, she and the doctor would go and, like, basically diffuse every single situation through diplomacy, which is fine. But then I'm sitting up there, like, waiting for the shot, got the bead, like, comes around to me, what are you doing? I'm aiming. What are you doing? I'm aiming. And I'm, like, I'm just so ready... Oh, we're shaking hands. All right, I'm folding up, putting it back in the case. Time to go back to the ship and just, like, do nothing. You know, so that was my Star Trek experience. Kyle, of course, being a big Star Trek guy, is like, if, if he would ever run one, he'd make it very different. Um, but to me, I always was like... I, I had a tainted view of the system after that, where I was just like, yeah, if you're trying to play a combat character, don't. Because, like, Star Trek's so cerebral that, like, usually if phasers come out as an absolute last resort. Depends on the era. Mm-hmm. But, um... <laughs> One thing about playing generic systems versus a system specifically designed for the for the uh, for the intellectual property is if you're playing a generic system, generic systems tend to be pretty generic. They don't have the the rules embedded in them that evoke some sort of feel of the property itself. Like if you were to um, play um, Star Wars in GURPS. You would have to do a lot of work to make um, the force feel like a factor in the game, mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. but and that's something that the the role that the role playing games built from the ground up to be Star Wars have excelled at. Oh yeah, and and they even got the whole like you know, fate and destiny is such a big part of Star Wars, whether you're rejecting it or following it, and you know the fact that it has that incorporated in the system in a like numerical amount. You know, with, like, fate points and destiny points. It makes it feel like Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And even, like, like if you were to run a Harry Potter game, it would be very awesome to have a game system that was built from the ground up to be Harry Potter, rather than having to take Dungeons & Dragons, which really does not evoke the feel of Harry Potter. When you're playing those characters, you're not... Fire and forget spells really don't fit well with within the Harry Potter mm-hmm. um, universe. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's Wingardium Leviosa, not Leviosa. <laughs> it's a good thing to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. I, I I'll admit I feel like I'm a little. I've only really done that. I've run Star Wars, played in Star Wars, played in Star Trek, and I think that's about it. Uh, excuse me, you played in Steven Universe. Oh, that's true. And I'm and very but, jealous. Of was it. it in an official role playing capacity? Uh, I don't know your history. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Not you. Thanks. I just know Nina mentioned it, and I got like incredibly jealous because I love. Yeah, Steven no, I, I have. I did play in a Steven Universe game. I don't know if the system released was a homebrew or if it was a legitimate like Steven Universe RPG. There's um, not one. It was homebrewed. I love. So I was right in asking you. I figured you would... I remember when I played it, and I just didn't know if it was a... I figured you would know if there was a system or not. Oh, yeah, there's... That's what I get for trusting you, like, even a moderate amount. Uh, But aside from those, though, I feel like that's kind of it. I've never... Like, I'm not a big Lord of the Rings guy anyway, but I've never played in, like, Lord of the Rings game. Um, or, Or what I'm saying specifically is I played in a lot of established IP games, but never in ones that were using a licensed, like, system. Mm-hmm. Besides Star Wars and Star Trek. So, I don't know. I I think that could be interesting. Could be, like, 
finding those if they exist and like comparing those to like the IPs I played in in generic systems. I can see what the difference is. If you're going to be running a game in a system, like in an established IP's like built up system, that means you're going to have to learn the system. Mm -hmm. And if you just convert it from a system that you already know, maybe everybody's fine with just filing the serial numbers off of whatever um, the intellect, whatever the base system is, and doing a very quick and dirty conversion over. But it's it's a lot of work learning a new system, um, and usually there's only one person who is going to be doing that work, and that is the game master. <laughs> yep, everyone wants to be like, "What do I do now?" Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, "Well, I wish I knew." <laughs> Me, anytime I try to learn a new system. We'll just figure it out as we go. Never do. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Like, total conversion is tough. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm in a game right now, or I'm running a game right now, where it's like, it's kind of steampunky, and I'm just running it in 3.5, and like, guns are there, and I'm happy to be like, well, let's use short bow stats for this gun, you know? That's not going to hold up in the long run, but I don't, you know. Which edition of D&D are you playing? Uh, it's 3.5. DMG has stats for guns. Really? Yep. Well, fuck me. I guess I know where I'm going after the podcast to DMG, Dungeon Master's Guide. Do you so, guys have a favorite IP system that you've played in? I only have two, so I think yeah, that's yeah, a little unfair. Far. I mean, Star Wars, definitely. But I'm also just, I like Star Wars better than Star Trek, so that's kind of unfair. Yeah, I've only familiarized myself with with two, um, a Star Wars and a Star Trek. Um, the Star Wars, um, well, I, I familiarized myself with two Star, uh, Star Wars, uh, the original D20, well, technically three, the original D20, the revised, and the Saga edition. So, and then I've only played in one Star Trek game, and I could tell you anything about the system now. So, I'm really not want to talk on this topic. Okay. So I'll stop talking. Yeah, I think the only thing that I've done is, uh, you said Call of Cthulhu, I guess because it's Lovecraft would yeah. be an IP. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's probably my favorite system, is Call of Cthulhu. Well, it's at least my favorite setting. I don't know if it's my favorite system, but I like the setting a lot. Yeah, I've run a lot of different IPs. Um, run Call of Cthulhu, um, run Star Wars, run Star Trek, um, run based on the Dark Tower series, not the god awful movie that not even Idris Elba could, and Matthew McConaughey could save. Yep. So we want to talk about um, how to bring someone in to an IP that they haven't experienced before. Because, um, like, whenever I started running that Fate game set in the um, the Fate universe there were a couple players who really hadn't had not encountered the anime at all that was in. yeah that was kind of awkward cuz like you had me and KP who like had read the visual novel and like watched the anime and like are pretty big fans and then you had like two people who had never interacted with it at all so you had just this huge gulf of experience mm-hmm. between the, the you kind of bridge cuz like you had watched the anime so you had like a, a knowledge of it you know but like that's that's kind of insane to think thinking back on it now you know that there was just such a like if, if it were the type of game where you were you're you're pretty impartial but if you were more arbitrary me and kp could have just been like well in in this this happens so we can do this you know but like and those other players would have been like what you know but like I, that that is definitely a risk mm-hmm. that comes with playing an established ip especially if the GM is not even arbitrary, maybe that's the wrong word, but, like, also a big fan of the series, for example, and is, like, willing to let you run with things because you know, like, you've read, like, the Star Wars series, you know, like, I, that game that I was in very briefly to tangent back, I got away with so much shit because the the guy running it was a huge fan, and, like, I, having read the books and been a huge, like, Star Wars is a big part of my life, still is, like, I could say all this stupid shit that I could get away with because he'd just be like, oh, that's cool, yeah, go do that, you know? And, like, versus, you know, other people in the game who, were like, like Star Wars, but were just like, where are you going? Like, why are you doing this? Like, c- come back, you know? Can mm-hmm. we talk about this? Um, 
you run into the dark side of the uh, issue. Hey, of, there it is. A, of a player using an IP to know exactly what what they're what is possible. Well, if they're really into that IP, they know everything that is possible. Mm-hmm. They know. Like, I'm like super anxious about the idea of playing either Star Wars or Star Trek with either of you people. <laughs> 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 I just have the barest little bit of knowledge. You about never it. watched the original trilogy till you were 19. Yeah, but you Jesus know. Christ! Even though it was <laughs> sitting on your fucking mantle, it was not. It was, I mean, it was sitting on our mantle, but my dad had only bought it like right before I watched it. We didn't own it until the new set came out. Like the DVD or like uh, probably this the was VHS. special edition VHS. I think it was special edition VHS, yeah. Interesting. So we've established what that dark side is. So how would you bridge the gap there? For me, um, I just really think um, for a television show, just like we were talking about before the podcast started, show them an episode that like... Show them the best episode. Yeah, exactly. That like really the, captures yeah. the essence of what you're going for. I have curated a list of Star Trek episodes that if you haven't ever watched, if you've never encountered Star Trek before, these are the essential things you must watch in order to to understand Star Trek. Star Trek. Interesting. Um, and I'm a big fan, as you all know, of having like a, a movie day or something like that out at my place. If we're going to be playing something to just get everybody on the same page of what the feel of whatever we're going to be playing is get a little hopefully it's something that where you might be able to get a little bit of backstory if it's something that's in an established IP or just learning the feel um, that way the game master is contr- well in the in the instances that where it's happened I've been the game master and I've had I've been the one showing the movies or TV shows um, you have absolute control over making sure that everybody has a baseline of what they know and what they understand of what's going on. And you can also tailor that so that if you're going to be playing, for instance, in Star Trek, but you're, you want to highlight a certain aspect that really isn't highlighted a whole lot in the series itself, like Section 31 being the, um, kind of like the covert ops, the shady side of the Federation, I can, pull up those episodes of um, Deep Space Nine and Enterprise and show you kind of what I'm going for this where you are in this um, idealized version of what humanity could be but there is definitely this dark underside to it Um, for like movies you know I think just watching the movie you know you can find time to do it if not like at least read the synopsis Mm -hmm. to get like a general idea Literature is a, a little bit more difficult because, like, reading a book these book days is—is is that realistic getting pe- though? Yes. Yeah, it's not. No, Haley, it's not. I no. cannot get players to read a three-paragraph backstory of the campaign we're getting ready to play, let alone getting them to read a book about the setting. Legit, I would read any dumb Jane Austen book if you told me we could play an RPG about it. I would read all of them, and we can get around and have tea and discuss. Oh, it would be so great. Mm. <laughs> you and Beth can do that. No. That's just like, no, don't Beth, group me in on this. Did you not hear the noise I made? I was hearing all of them. <laughs> Haley, I think you're, you're alone. <laughs> well, that's not to be Jane Austen. Oh, I hate Jesus. Jane Austen. Well, okay, uh, we're actually on the same page there. <laughs> I, but, like, I don't know. If I were running... If, like, it was around Halloween time, and... Uh, I was like, I'm going to run a, a one-shot. Of X-Files, which is something, another intellectual property you've done. Abs- oh my god! <laughs> I forgot that I ran an X-Files game! I'm an idiot! <laughs> um, that was in World of Darkness, so it wasn't a generic system, but I have, in fact, run an X-Files game twice. Um, wow. Just Is this what it's like when you play for a long time? Like, do you forget things constantly? Yes. Wow. All the time. Holy shit. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, like, if I were to run X-Files... Um, and I was like, yeah, I really want to base it off of one episode in, like, one of the seasons. Obviously, I'd be like, hey, you guys, if you can watch this episode, do it. If not, great. Um, you know, if I were to, like, go a little bit more, I guess, quote-unquote, old school, you know, and do, like, a gothic horror, I'd be like, hey, go read, like, Red Mask of Death. You know, like, I've always really liked that Poe story. Like, read that. That's, like, the vibe I'm going for. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, or, like, hey, I'm going to run a slasher game. Like, one shot. Go watch Halloween, you know. 
And like, if people do it, great. If not, and here's the hope too. You know, usually since the type of people that play D and D uh, typically are also culture whores, to be honest. Um, <laughs> like nine times out of ten, maybe they haven't seen that episode of X Files, but they've seen X Files some to some extent. Uh, maybe not X Files anymore. That had a revival on Netflix, so maybe. Like I'm trying, I don't know, uh, but you know, ho- most people have seen Halloween. I would think one of them, well, at least one of them. So you know the vibe. Like obviously, the first two are the best. But uh, you're talking about the Rob Zombie directed ones, right? Yeah, I really <laughs> love the Rob Zombie uh, revisioning of Halloween, especially where he makes his wife Jesus. Really hits home for me. Um, but I don't know. Like, the, I, I would just hope that people had seen it, seen some of it, had some idea going in. Just because I feel like... But even then, you know, I'm also okay that if you don't have time to do those things and you still want to play, show up anyway. Like, you'll, you'll get the vibe pretty quick, you know? Because yeah. a lot of that stuff is... Okay, so you've never read Red Mask of Death, sure. But, like, you'll have to have read some gothic horror in high school. Everybody had to read Dracula or Frankenstein. Like... Frankenstein is so good. I don't know. So I feel like people would at least know some element of the vibe that you're going for mm-hmm. enough to be able to play it in the one shot. Yeah. And, and just by saying those three things, though, like episode of X-Files or Mask of Death, Halloween, people will be able to associate those ideas with other things and, like, have a general idea. Mm-hmm. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Forrest Gump RPG. Let's do it. I'm ready. <laughs> Who's, who wants to play Forrest Gump? Talk about playing Mary Sue's. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> The most influential historical character in a long time. <laughs> well, we're, we're starting to run long, so let's go ahead and start talking about if anybody has any geek things that are they're interested in or is going on. Um, I just have one. Um, I watched a short film on Amazon Prime called The Manual. It's about it's less than half an hour long. It's a sci-fi um, short film. Really good. I would recommend anyone watch it. I don't want to give away too much. There's, it's sci-fi and there's a robot in it. <laughs> um, I got two. I recently watched a Netflix movie but uh, called How It Ends, starring Forrest Whitaker. It reminded me a lot of Apocalyptia, actually. like, like it, it almost felt like an Apocalyptia campaign. Um, and so I guess if, if you like what we've talked about in Apocalyptia, maybe you've played it, maybe not. I was, I'm going to recommend it to Jordan when I see, it again, when I see him again. But um, check this movie out, because it definitely, to me, fit the vibe of, like, what an Apocalyptia campaign could be. Um, it's just one giant road trip, essentially, which is, for most purposes, in, in a standard Apocalyptia game, kind of what that is. Um, and the second thing is Stardew Valley? Valley? Yeah. Um, which is, like, a Harvest Moon-style uh, Steam game, and may also be on the consoles now. Just updated with co-op. Me and Nina have been playing that, and uh, it's a lot of fun. So if you like... Stuff like Harvest Moon and, like, farming simulators, you know, and, like, all that fun stuff. Check it out. Uh, I got two. So, there's this anime called Little Witch Academia, and it's really good. It's so cute and fluffy, and, um, it reminds me a lot of, like, My Hero Academia, because that's what I thought I was clicking on, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but then I got sucked in, and now I can't stop watching it. Uh, I hear it's it's a confined thing, like, it has two seasons, it told its story, and it's, like, in and out, there's a movie, and there's also, like, a short that's, like, its own little thing, Um, and it's one of the best anime series I've ever watched. It's beautiful, it looks like a Miyazaki film, and it has a really good story, and I'm gonna cosplay... All of the characters. <laughs> Speaking of cosplay, my second point is me. Follow me on Instagram at Bay the Fae, and that's B A E the and then F A E, because I got some cool cosplay stuff going on. Tomorrow I'm doing a Harry Potter shoot on the green, and then two weeks from now I'm doing another Suicide Squad shoot. So be on the lookout for that. Um, I've got one actually. It was, it's called The Bleeding Edge. It's on Amazon, or not Amazon, but Netflix. And uh, it's a documentary about the FDA's process, or lack thereof, for approving medical devices. They talk about the fact there, that there are like two major problems with their approval of medical devices. One is that you can get a device immediately approved if it is considered substantially similar to a device that's already been approved, 
which can then itself have been approved based on the same thing, substantially similar to another device. And you can have like this huge line of these so that, you know, at some point you're approving things, you're basically grandfathering things in that shouldn't be. And, um, and then also it was talking about how the other thing is, even if a previous device has been recalled due to severe issues or causing injury or even death to people, you can still have a device approved that's substantially similar to that device. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it's completely, it's, it's just one of those, I really enjoy medical documentaries, particularly ones I can watch and get really angry about. And this is really, <laughs> I just get like, really <laughs> mad. <laughs> like yelling at the TV. Yeah, exactly. That's why I watch sports. <laughs> All right, guys, what do you say we stop this bullshit and start rolling some dice? Woo! This has been a production of Alien Familiar Media. You can find past episodes and more at alienfamiliar.com. You can email us at alienfamiliarmedia at gmail.com. This production is protected under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Music for this episode is Suburban Outlaw by Forget the Whale and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.